Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that Barabbas is like us, could be saved, that Christ would die in our place, that we were as undeserving as he was, as sinful and wretched. Although our sins might be different, we were still as deserving of eternal punishment as Barabbas was, yet just as Christ died in his place, he's died in ours, Lord. I thank you for that reality to be focused on as we come to the portion of the worship service where your word washes over us. I pray you'd give us great thankfulness for what Christ has done and great thankfulness for your word and the work that it does in our lives to conform us to his image and likeness. I thank you for these verses too that answer what might be one of the more common questions we have in our lives about uh, marriage and what it looks like in eternity. Few things on this side of heaven are as important, uh, occupy as much of our time, or as uh, what decision is more important than who we marry. And so with something that is so relevant to our lives, it, it begs the question what, what marriage would look like after we die. And so I thank you for these verses that answer that for us, Lord. I thank you for the wonderful truths that are contained in them. I pray that you would bring those forth to your people this morning. To use me as your vessel to rightly divide the scriptures. If there's anything that's not in my notes that you'd have me preach to your people, then I do pray that you'd bring that to mind, Lord. I believe I've labored and sought your, your will regarding what what is uh, preached, but if anything's missing, Lord, don't deprive your people. Uh, allow them to hear that this morning, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Sunday mornings, we're working our way through Luke's gospel, verse by verse, and we find ourselves at Luke 20, verse 27. So September 11th, Islam received lots of attention because the 19 hijackers were Muslims, and people understandably wondered why they would fly planes into buildings, killing themselves and killing thousands of others in the process. And we learned that many of them did this for what reason? What would they be given? Does anyone know? I think a lot of people might not have known before September 11th, but after that, 72 wives. They believed that if they did this, they'd immediately go to heaven and have 72 virgins to satisfy them for all eternity. When, <clears throat> when Eugene shared during Sunday school, he mentioned that Mormons believe in what they call celestial marriage or eternal marriage or temple marriage. And this doctrine teaches that marriages can last forever in heaven if the couple is wed in a Mormon temple. Here's what I read from the website, Why Mormonism? When a bride and groom are married in the temple, they are sealed together. They are married not only for this life, but for the life after. Jesus Christ taught that what God has joined together, let, let no man put asunder, Matthew 19, 6. The idea of eternal marriage informs the Mormon's view of death, that death is a temporary separation of loved ones. They can be together again in the eternities. Mormon elder James A. Cullimore said marriage in the temple for time and eternity should be the goal of every member of the church. God promised the prophet Joseph Smith in a revelation, if a man marries a wife by the new and everlasting covenant by him who was anointed, it shall be of full force when they are out of the world. Therefore, those sealed in a Mormon temple have the promise that their relationship will continue on forever. An eternal marriage not only blesses the husband and wife, but their children... The couple is sealed together, and any children they have are sealed to them. So earlier this month, Katie and I celebrated our 18th year of marriage. We've had 10 children together, or if you want to count the uh, miscarriages, we've had at least 13 children. Most of our 18 years of marriage have been in ministry together with all of the blessings and all of the trials that come with it. We have experienced more together in our relationship than I feel like most of the other relationships in my life combined. Sometimes it's hard to believe it's only been 18 years because of all it seems like we've been through together. Nobody knows me as well as Katie. I can't imagine being as close to anyone as I am to her. I, because Katie and I grew up together in Northern California, we frequently joked about how, about how much better our lives would have been if we had gotten married on the playground when we were <laughs> together. The, the things we could have avoided or been spared from. So I share all this to make the simple point that marriage in heaven sounds good to me. I would love if, I mean, I'm assuming I would love this because I don't fully understand heaven. If I had a fuller understanding of heaven, I probably wouldn't desire marriage in heaven. But because of my limited understanding, marriage in heaven sounds great. I'd love to continue my relationship with Katie into the next life. I suppose if I was Mormon, I love the idea of continuing the relationship with my children because they, they seem to be 
sealed together, it says, sealed with their parents. But the problem is what? Yeah, it's just not true. You only need to hear those verses once to recognize that there is not marriage in heaven. And scripture is our authority. We don't get to pragmatically or intuitively create realities just because we might think they're more attractive or they sound better. So let me give you the context for this morning's verses. The religious leaders have been trying to trap Jesus. The first time, if you look just, if we use just Luke chapter 20, was in verses 1 through 8 when they questioned Jesus about his authority. Then in verses 9 through 18, Jesus preached the parable of the vineyard owner, and he declared that the vineyard owner who represents God is going to execute the tenants who represent the religious leaders. And so God made it clear to those listening that God is going, or Jesus made clear to those listening that God the Father is going to destroy the religious leaders. He said this in the temple, we're a few days removed from Passover, and so this means the most religious and devout Jews would have been there to hear Jesus declare that the religious leaders will be destroyed by God. Now obviously this is going to infuriate the religious leaders even more, and you can see that in verse 19. The scribes and chief priests, they sought to lay hands on Jesus at that very hour that he preached this parable because they perceived that he told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they wanted to arrest Jesus. They can't do that. So they work even harder to discredit him because if they can't arrest him, the best they think they can do is discredit him. If Jesus looks bad, then the religious leaders won't look bad, right? If Jesus looks bad, then people won't believe the things that he's saying about them. And so in verses 19 to 26, they ask their second question just in this chapter about paying taxes to Caesar. We covered this two sermons ago. This attempt failed miserably, as did the other attempts leading up to this chapter, but the religious leaders are not giving up yet. Now they come up with their third and final question in verses 27 to 40. So let's look at it together. Luke 20, 27. There came to Jesus some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. This is actually the only instance in the gospel where Jesus comes into direct conflict with the Sadducees. Normally it's the Sadducees and the Pharisees or the scribes. Previously, they were always associated with some other group, but right here they come against Jesus by themselves. We're going to need to understand them to understand their question. And this brings us to lesson one. The Sadducees rejected the supernatural. The Sadducees rejected the supernatural. It seems like the high priest in Jesus' day belonged to the Sadducees, which is pretty shocking to me that the high priests would be individuals who reject the supernatural or reject the resurrection or eternal life. They're a small but wealthy and powerful sect. They were the aristocratic party. They were worldly-minded. They were willing to cooperate with the Romans to maintain their privileged position. So in other words, they had Rome's favor. They, Rome was content to keep them in power as long as they carried out Rome's will uh, regarding the Jews. The Sadducees believed the first five books of the Bible are what we call the books of Moses or the Pentateuch. They're originally one book written by Moses. They're broken up into five books in our Bibles, and they either rejected or gave secondary or little importance to the other books of the Bible, the historical books, the books we know as the historical or poetic or, or prophetic books. So they're the ancient versions of modern liberal theologians. So if you want to know what they look like today, they look like the individuals who come on the scene and uh, might appear scholarly or claim to be very wise, but roll their eyes at the idea of eternal life or the resurrection or anything supernatural. They don't believe in angels, miracles, resurrections, or life after death. Now, does anyone know the classic joke about the Sadducees? <laughs> what is it? They don't believe in the resurrection, which is why they are... <laughs> yeah, that's good, that's good. What do you guys think? Keep that one or get rid of it? Yeah? yeah? Okay, thanks, Diane. Thank you, one person who liked that joke. So, this is why the Sadducees oppose the apostles preaching the resurrection. You don't have to turn there. I'll go through this quickly. Acts 4.1, the Sadducees were greatly annoyed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Listen to what Paul said 
so he's before the religious council and the religious council consisted of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which is pretty surprising to me because they would seem to be so unequally yoked. I don't know how they could work together, but they did. And so when Paul was before them, Acts 23, 6, he perceived that one part of the council were Sadducees and the other Pharisees. And Paul cried out, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. So Paul says, the only reason I've been arrested or the reason that I'm here is I believe in the resurrection and that's what I've been preaching. The next verse, Acts 23, 7. When Paul said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided for the Sadducees say there's no resurrection nor angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. So they started quarreling amongst themselves <laughs> because they disagreed about the resurrection. Now, if we understand the sad, and this, I'm saying this loosely, I could be wrong, but this is also probably why there was so much effort among the religious leaders, or probably in particular the Sadducees, to murder Lazarus after he'd been raised from the dead, right? When you're claiming that nobody can be resurrected, and then Jesus raises someone, you, a g generally a reasonable person, with even the tiniest amount of humility would change their theology, right? But not the Sadducees. They decide instead that they're going to murder the man Jesus raised to prevent anyone from thinking that they're wrong. I mean, that is incredibly stubborn and proud. And if we understand the Sadducees, we can understand why they would ask Jesus this question about the resurrection. So look in verse 28. They asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and his wife has no children, the man, the brother of, the, of his deceased brother, must take his widow and raise up offspring for his brother who passed away. Verse 29, now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. Verse 30, the second. Verse 31, the third took her and likewise all seven left no children and died. Verse 32, afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? for the seven had her as wife. Now, we covered this in a sermon last week. This is known as levirate marriage, and it's part of Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. So, or another way to say it is it's part of one of the books or part of the books that the Sadducees believe to be true. Or another way to say it is the Sadducees believe that levirate marriage is commanded. And so they come to Jesus with this question. Leverate marriage commands men to marry the widowed wife of their deceased brother. Uh, John MacArthur said it assumes that this living brother must not be married yet to provide that widow with a son who's going to do a few things. First, she's going to care for, he's going to care for his mother because the picture of weakness, women in general were the picture of weakness and vulnerability in the ancient world. The only way you get worse than that is when you've got a woman who's widowed or a woman who has no children to care for her. And so this living brother to provide this son that's going to care for her is going to continue the deceased brother's name and is also going to continue the deceased brother's inheritance because like we talked about last week, it was God's plan that land remained within the family, that nobody would result, be destitute and nobody would be able to develop a monopoly, right? And so, but for inheritance and a name to continue, there must be a brother, a son from that brother who's died. And so this brother, who is going to bear the same, come from the same family, is going to provide this son for that widow. Now the question, it's more, it's, it's not simply hypothetical or theoretical. It, is, it has application for us today because there are individuals who will end up in heaven having had multiple spouses in this life, right? Whether because they were widowed and then married someone else or because of, of divorce and then remarriage. And so there is application for us. So they think they have trapped Jesus because if Jesus says there's a resurrection, then he's got to be able to resolve this dilemma. So they know that he believes in the resurrection, although they, they reject it. And so they bring this question, knowing that if Jesus says that he believes in the resurrection, there's this impossible dilemma that he's not going to be able to resolve. The alternative is that Jesus says, okay, you got me. 
there is no resurrection. And then he looks like this false teacher. So the Sadducees, probably like most of the others who have tried to trap Jesus, are feeling very confident uh, in this question. So it's like they ask, if you believe in a supposed resurrection, how do you explain this? Whose wife is this going to be in the next life? And then look at Jesus' response in verse 34. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age, referring to us, marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, to the next life and to the resurrection from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, at the beginning of the sermon, I quoted an article defending the Mormon doctrine of celestial marriage. And you might remember the article, because it was pages long, but one reason I chose this is that article actually quoted who besides Joseph Smith and a Mormon elder? Who do they quote to defend celestial marriage? Jesus. Ironically, they quoted Jesus' words in Matthew 19, 6. And that's ironic because Jesus had the strongest, clearest statement that there is no marriage in the next life. And this brings us to lesson two. The next life is different than this life. The next life is different than this life. Now, it doesn't come out in Luke, but in the parallel accounts in Matthew and Mark, Jesus does rebuke them. Just listen to this. Jesus does rebuke the Sadducees, and then I'll tell you why in a moment. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Jesus answered them, You're wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Or Mark twelve twenty four. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you're wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God? We, people shouldn't be rebuked for being ignorant. Ignorant simply means you don't know. I know it has a very negative connotation. We would feel insulted if people told us we were ignorant, but scripturally speaking, it just means that you don't know. In a sense, there's nothing wrong with being ignorant. Jesus didn't rebuke them for being ignorant. He rebuked them for being foolish. They did know better. They were religious leaders. They claimed to hold to scripture, yet they missed this very simple truth that there's no marriage in the next life. The problem is they thought the next life was the same as this life. We marry in this life, so we must marry in the next life. But the next life is not a mere continuation of the present life, and one of the major differences is the absence of marriage. And in verse 36, we see why there's no, we see why there's no marriage in heaven. For they cannot die anymore, because this is referring, the they is the sons of this age, or us, because they or we are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. The word for is synonymous with because. So Jesus is saying there's no marriage in heaven because there's no death in heaven. That's what that verse means, simply put. There's no marriage in heaven because there's no death in heaven. Now, that might not sound like it makes a whole lot of sense, right, at first. What does marriage and death have to do with each other? Why would there be no marriage just because there's no death? Because marriage has always been a temporary institution to allow for procreation or preservation of the human race. We have marriage so we can have children. That's not to say that because of the fall, everyone is able to have children. There are just a lot, like there's health issues or disease or sicknesses and weaknesses with our body, individuals who are unable to have children but that still doesn't deny the reality that one of the primary purposes of marriage is preservation of the human race, having children. But without death, there's no need for more children. Now, why do you think Jesus might have mentioned angels here, even though they didn't ask about angels? They didn't believe in them. It was just one more thing for him to easily correct about their theology. He could have made these points without mentioning angels, but because he's speaking to Sadducees who don't believe in them, he corrects this area too. It's essential to notice that Jesus said equal to angels rather than identical to angels, or even that we become angels. So in other words, there are some similarities, but we're not the same, we're not identical, and we don't become angels. So we're equal to angels in these ways. There's five that I can see and possibly a sixth. Here's one way we're equal to or like angels, at least in the next life. They're immortal and we'll be immortal. They don't die, we won't die. They don't experience death, we don't experience death. 
They don't marry, we won't marry. They don't have children, we won't have children. Angels are called sons of God in Job 1.6, Job 38.7, and Genesis 6.12, and we're called sons of God in Romans 8.14, Romans 8.19, and Galatians 3.26, and some other places. Now, there's one more possible similarity, and I say possible because I'm not convinced this is true, but I'm not convinced it's not true. Or I'm convinced that maybe it goes beyond something I can uh, fully understand. So I'll just say this. There's at least enough commentaries that made this point, and it seems to possibly be alluded to enough in these verses that I'll pass this along, that maybe genders will cease, or at least maybe they'll cease the way that we know them. Now, I do know that angels are always spoken of what way? Just like God himself. Masculinely, right? Pronouns that are used and the names given. What are the names of angels that we know? Michael, Gabriel, they're all spoken of masculinely. God is always spoken of. He, him, all three persons, God Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all spoken of with masculine pronouns. The pulpit commentary, for example, reads, we may assume from Jesus' words that the difference between the sexes will have ceased to exist. I don't know if we can fully understand this on this side of heaven, but I thought it was worth mentioning because of the possibility. Now, I want to back up to get some momentum into an important point in this account. When the new generation was in the wilderness, so you're kind of reading through numbers, there's a rebellion with the spies, and it's not super clear, but numbers jumps forward to the new generation and doesn't really discuss the 38 years of wandering. So you've got the rebellion at the border of the promised land, that generation is told they'll die, they die, and then the account basically resumes with the new generation. Now with the new generation, which are the children, of the parents who died, these children started sounding a lot like what? What, are they, what? what were these children doing that their parents did? Complaint. Okay, well, let me ask this. When you're reading through numbers, is it like an old generation that's really ungodly and complains and a new generation that's really godly and gives thanks? You actually might not even know that you transitioned from <laughs> the old generation to the new generation because the children sound just like the parents. And apparently God didn't want to put up with it or thought they should have known better because he sent serpents, fiery or serpents, through the camp and were biting these people. Moses famously raises up a bronze serpent on a pole, this dramatic picture of Christ. If individuals look to this bronze serpent to be saved, just as we look to Christ to be saved. Bronze, a picture of fire, because it's tried in the fire, a serpent pictured of sin, and so the bronze serpent, a picture of sin being lifted up and judged which is what transpired on the cross with Christ, right? Look to the bronze serpent to be saved. Look to Christ to be saved. So something interesting happened with this bronze serpent over the centuries. When we reach Hezekiah's day, what were the people doing with it? They don't know what the people were doing with the bronze serpent. They called it Nehushtan. They started worshiping it. And so when Hezekiah, probably the second greatest reformer, only to Josiah, is purging all of the idolatry and wickedness from the land. Listen to this. 2 Kings 18.4, Hezekiah removed the high places, broke the pillars, cut down the Asherah, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. So the object that had been such a blessing had become this idol. And that account's always stuck out to me about the potential that we have because of our depravity or sinfulness to even take the best things or the greatest blessings that God gives us and pollute them or allow them to become sinful, especially if they become an idol, especially if they become something we covet. And we've talked about that, covetousness and idolatry. I mean, if the first commandment forbids idolatry and the tenth commandment forbids covetousness, and Paul says that covetousness is idolatry, then the ten commandments begin and end with the same commandment. And so covetousness is idolatry. Anytime we desire something so much that we elevate it above God, that's an idol. And we can do that with even really good things. Now, I don't think that you have to attend WCC very long to recognize that we have a high and positive view of marriage. We have a high and positive view of family and children. I even feel more comfortable making the next point or sounding as though I'm minimizing marriage and children because of the very high view that we have of these. 
at WCC. The reason I say sounding like I'm minimizing marriage and children versus minimizing them is because I'm really not. I'm not minimizing marriage, family, or children. Instead, I'm maximizing. Or let me say it like this. I'm not minimizing our relationship with our spouse. I don't want to minimize our relationship with our children, and I don't want to minimize the importance of family. But what I want to do, because I think it is one of the most important points from these verses, is maximize our relationship with Christ. That's what these verses are primarily doing. If they do anything besides answer whether we have marriage in heaven, it is reveal, revealing what the most important relationship in heaven is, our relationship with Christ, and is not our relationship with our wife and our children. And this brings us to lesson three. Heaven is primarily about Christ. <clears throat> to connect the dots in case that wasn't clear enough, we can take many good things and make them Nehushtan or turn them into a brown serpent we worship. And we can do that with marriage. If we start, and I, I became a Christian, super wanted to get married, told, you know, I joked earlier, Katie and I wish we got married on the playground, right? Well, I got married when I was 26, which is about four years after becoming a Christian. And so I remember how strong that desire was to, to be married. Katie became pregnant soon after we were married, so there wasn't a real long time that we went, went without children. So that wasn't a struggle, but I am sensitive to that desire to want to be married. And because it's so strong and because that desire to have children or family is so strong, it is possible to covet these and for that to become idolatry or to elevate these things above Christ. You might wonder what Mormons do with Jesus' statement that there is no marriage in the next life. And they do have an answer for that. According to the Mormon's New Testament student manual, they believe that we are the ones who are in error. So listen to this. They said some people have misinterpreted the Savior's words in these verses that we're studying to mean that there is no eternal marriage. Elder James E. Talmadge pointed out that the Savior's words do not state that marriages will not exist, af exist after the resurrection, but that marriages will not be performed after the resurrection. In the resurrection, there will be no marrying nor giving in marriage, for all questions of marital status must be settled before that time. Now, that is a sad thing. It's sad when we have a doctrine that we want to hold to so badly, we will deny the simple and plain teaching of God's word, right? So in that, coming out of Catholicism, I saw how commonly this can happen where there is a belief or practice from a religion that we're part of, yet we see God's word contradict it, and instead of holding to God's word, we will twist or manipulate scripture, deny the simple plain teaching of the text to be able to continue holding to that doctrine which is exactly what sadly mormons are doing here the biblical and so the discussion of idolatry is i believe that mormons have elevated marriage or marriage and family to this almost idolatrous level the biblical understanding of heaven differs significantly from the mormon view that elevates it to that idolatrous level. The biblical understanding of heaven differs significantly from the Muslim view that makes heaven, uh, not to be crude, but sound like the place where your wildest fantasies are satisfied sexually speaking. Apparently, to the Muslim man, that is what's greatest. And so they have created a heaven where that is the reality of the reality for it. I mean, at least all your fantasies are satisfied for men. I'm not, I'm not joking, but I don't know why any Muslim virgins would want to go to heaven if it meant that they're just going to be one of 72 wives for some man. As much as we might love our spouse and our children, the biblical view is that heaven is heaven because of Christ. That's it. Heaven is heaven is... And preach the gospel to your loved ones. We want our loved ones to be in heaven. Preach the gospel to your friends and neighbors. Look forward to seeing them in heaven when they repent and come to Christ. But heaven isn't heaven because of any of those people that are there. 
Heaven is heaven because we spend eternity worshiping Christ, thinking about what he has done for us. Listen to these verses that make this point. Revelation 21. If you want to see the, read what I believe are probably the clearest chapters describing heaven, it'd be Revelation 21 and 22. Just to give you a few verses from these chapters, Revelation 21, uh, 22, I saw no temple in the city. Its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And you can read the whole chapter, and guess what there's no mention of? Marriage. I mean, unless you're talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19, or you're associating our relationship with Christ to the relationship between Christ's bride, the church, and him. But in terms of earthly relationship, there's no hint or elevation of marriage or children. The next chapter, Revelation 22, 1, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and of the Lamb. No longer will be, there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. So heaven is about the Lord, it is about worshiping him. And I, I will say this, and this might not be said often enough, because we do want to celebrate marriages, but we recognize that some people, for whatever reason, are unmarried. Either they're, they're widowed, perhaps, or they, God hasn't provided them with a spouse yet, or perhaps they're divorced and remaining unmarried, and there can be uh, a sadness associated with that state. But I will say this, that is a sadness or grief that only lasts for the rest of our earthly days. So as soon as, I mean, I'm just thinking, if I was a Mormon and I'm not married, I wouldn't look forward to heaven as much, right? Because I'm missing out on whatever everyone else gets to enjoy that got married in that temple. But it's only an earthly institution, so any grief or sadness associated with being, not having a spouse on this side of heaven ends, concludes on this side of heaven. So I'll conclude this lesson by saying this. We want our loved ones in heaven with us, but heaven is heaven not because of any earthly relationship, but instead because of the Lord. Now, I told you the Sadducees believe in the Bible's first five books, but not in the resurrection. Can you guess one of the reasons why the Sadducees, and I don't want to sound like I'm making a defense for them, because we'll see in a moment, or actually you can already tell there's no defense, because Jesus rebuked them for not knowing better. But can you suspect why the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection if they only hold to the first five books of the Bible? Or let me say it like this, can you think of the resurrection coming from the first five books of the Bible? If you're honest, probably not really, right? There's very little said about it. But Jesus will correct their wrong understanding of the resurrection, and he is going to use one of those five books that they believe in to do so. And which book is that? He uses Exodus. Look at Luke 20, verse 37. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Luke is the only gospel that adds the words, for all live to him. So we don't live only for the Lord on this side of heaven. We live for the Lord in the next life as well. My suspicion is why we might tend to think that we only live for Christ in this life is because Paul said what? To live, to live as Christ, to die as gain, right? Which almost implies like maybe you stop living for Christ. He just means you're only, when you're physically alive, you're physically living for Christ. And then to die is to gain, to go to, be with, to, go to heaven. But he didn't mean that we would stop living for Christ in terms of being his servants or worshiping him. And this brings us to lesson four. God doesn't rule over non-existent people. God doesn't rule over non-existent people. I'll tell you guys something I was thinking about that I shared with someone the other day. It's been on my mind as I've continued going verse by verse through Luke. If you, if you teach topically or you preach a topical message, you have an opportunity to kind of arrange that sermon how you want and really kind of add in other parts. I don't want to say make that sermon as exciting as you want, but there's flexibility with it. You're not bound to those verses. 
and if I do any guest preaching or marriage conferences, then you're able to really kind of orchestrate what these messages look like. But if you're going to go verse by verse through God's Word, then it can seem a little plainer. You reach verses or passages like this that might not seem quite as thrilling as some of the other passages that you would choose if you were preaching topically. But the reality is that expositional preaching like this through God's Word is incredibly important and is really the healthy diet that we need as believers because it's going to bring us to those passages that we might not encounter otherwise and prevents us from ever jumping over something. So if you're ever to come to church, even if you're out of town and you're visiting another church and they're going verse by verse, and they reach some passage and you kind of look and you're like, oh boy, I don't really want to come to church and hear a sermon on these verses because they look, they, they look a little boring to me. You don't want to feel that way because it's still part of God's word, which means it's part of his plan for us to hear these verses at some point. We have to have a diet that consists of all of God's word without skipping over parts that we might not think are as, as thrilling. Now here's the verse that Jesus is referencing in this account. Exodus 3, 6, God said to Moses, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So it's kind of like Jesus said this to the Sadducees, if I was to put it in my own words. You Sadducees, in your own arbitrary, arrogant fashion, you set aside the authority of the prophets and the other inspired books, except for the first five. So I'm going to argue with you from these five books. You know the account of Moses at the burning bush, and it reveals your error. This is why you're foolish instead of ignorant. So when God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, the patriarchs, so we're going forward, you know, over four centuries, four and a half centuries at least, because this is after the four and a half centuries that they've been in Egypt. You've also got the death of, of Jacob's son. Uh, you've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph's death. So my point is this, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have been dead for about four and a half centuries by this point. But God doesn't rule over people who don't exist. If God was still their God, they must still be alive. Otherwise, what would God have said? He wouldn't say, I am the God of these men. He would say, I, I was the God of these men, but they've ceased, not ceased living, because that's accepted, but ceased existing. But the fact that he's still their God means they still exist, which means they're still alive, which means there is a resurrection. And so he contradicts their error with this really beautifully. Spurgeon said, a living God is the God of living men, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. Here are a few points that were taught in these verses. Those who leave this life continue to live. They live personally, or we will live personally when this life ends for us. We are individuals in the life to come. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My point is, they continued to be individuals. They were, they were still Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not anonymous. They're mentioned by name. They're not going to die again. They live as sons of God. They are immortal. We will be immortal with our glorified bodies. They're not lost. We know where they are. They also know where they are. If you do wonder about what earthly relationships might be maintained one of the interesting considerations is from Luke 19 with the account of the rich man and Lazarus, which I've told you before I don't think is a parable. There, I don't want to go into all the dis differences between that account and parables, but I don't think it's a parable. I think it's an account of two real people, the rich man and Lazarus. And it seemed like when the rich man was dead, he still recognized two. His brothers, or still recognized them as brothers. So even though there won't be marriage and our relationship with Christ is exalted above every other relationship, it does seem like perhaps in the next life there will still be acknowledgement of those earthly familial relationships that we have. Now, there's much to learn from how Jesus responded to the Sadducees when they tried to trap him. This, so follow me on this. The question is about the resurrection or it's about something supernatural. They deny the resurrection. They deny everything supernatural. They deny miracles. So in response... I would expect Jesus to answer them with something supernatural. Do something miraculous. Instead, how did he respond? And this is important. With what? He didn't respond with a miracle. He responded with what? And this brings us to lesson five. Respond with scripture. 
respond with scripture. Jesus sets an excellent example by using scripture to argue against the Sadducees. Not what I would expect with people who deny the supernatural. Now, when you're God in the flesh and people deny the supernatural, what do you do? Do something supernatural. If they deny miracles, perform a miracle. They deny the resurrection, raise someone from the dead. Jesus had no problem doing any of those things, but instead he responded with Scripture. Who else did he respond to Scripture with? The devil, listen to this. The devil, Luke 4, 3, the devil said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus answered, it's written. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Jesus said, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil said, all these kingdoms I'll give you if you worship me. Jesus said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So three times Jesus was tempted and he responded with scripture. Probably a great example to us, not just how to respond to questions, but how to respond to temptation in general with scripture. And I stress this because here's what we tend, okay, I don't want to project myself on you guys. I'll say it like this. I'm stressing this because here's what I tend to think. Jesus is the son of God. He, he's divine. He's God in the flesh. He's man. He's got humanity, but he's also got deity. And so that's why he can answer questions so brilliantly. That's why he's able to resist temptation perfectly. And I just want to tell you, I think we're making a huge mistake if we think that. Or I'm making a huge mistake when I think that. Because what scripture does or let me say it like this, what scripture doesn't do is emphasize Jesus's deity. It emphasizes his humanity. How instructive or helpful would it be for us if Jesus found himself, himself in these accounts and we end up seeing his deity or we end up seeing things that we couldn't do? What would you do then? You'd be like, oh man, well, that's pretty discouraging. I mean, I'm happy for Jesus to be able to do this and live this perfect life on my behalf, but what good does that do me? I mean, I'm not God in the flesh, so I'm just stuck with my humanity here. And so what scripture does is it de-emphasizes in many situations. There are, there are places where Christ's deity is emphasized, the transfiguration, the time he performed miracles. But when he responded to questions or when he faced temptation, he responded with scripture. He responded like a man. Instead of responding supernaturally or extraordinarily, he responds naturally and ordinarily. In other words, he doesn't look like the Son of God in these accounts. He looks like the Son of Man in these accounts. He did not draw on anything only available to him and not us. He had the same or used the same resource that we have at our disposal, and that's the Word of God. Now, I think this is important, and I've noticed the tendency in the church over the years, especially within charismatic circles, to want to be like Jesus in the wrong ways. That's probably the simplest way to say it. Nobody, no Christian is going to say they don't want to be like Christ, but I do notice that people will want to be like Christ in the wrong ways and not want to be like Christ in the right ways. And what I mean is, and I would, and I hope I don't sound harsh when I say this, but when you see people that make this error, do not let them be your teachers. <laughs> do not follow them and do not look at their example and do not learn from them. And I'm talking about those people, when they talk about Christ, they talk about the supernatural and miraculous. Or in other words, when they talk about being like Jesus or they encourage you to be like Jesus or they say that they are like Jesus, but it's all about healing or miracles or the supernatural. Now, I'm not saying we don't pray for healing, and I'm not saying we don't observe James 5 and go and anoint and pray for healing, but that is a far cry from the supernatural power Christ had and the apostolic power the 12 had. Instead, and I don't think we hear this a whole lot because it's just not very attractive, if you want to be like Jesus, be holy. If you want to be like Jesus, love if you want to be like Jesus, serve. If you want to be like Jesus, worship, pray, resist temptation, live a God-fearing, a God-pleasing life. 
Those are the ways that we should strive to be like Jesus. Our last verse for this morning, Luke 20, 39, some of the scribes answered, and I don't think this is easy for them to say. I mean, the scribes have not been the biggest fans of Christ, but he'd even won them over by this point. And, they, and I, don't think they, I think they mean this sincerely. I might be wrong, but they said, Teacher, you have spoken well. And who are the scribes? They're the ones who are penning or rewriting scripture. So more than likely, they knew this account at the burning bush, heard Jesus' answer, were impressed by it. They often oppose Jesus, but even here in this situation... I'm sure, to the irritation of the Pharisees and the irritation of the Sadducees, the scribes could not help but praise Christ for his answer. Verse 40, they, and I, this refers not only to the scribes, but to to all the religious leaders who had been questioning Jesus. It says, they no longer dared to ask him any question. So it seems like they finally learned their lesson. Because at this point, you're kind of starting to roll your eyes, right? You're like, when are you guys going to learn, man? I mean, how foolish do you guys have to look? And the other thing, it's not just that Jesus made them look bad, he made himself look good. It's because every single answer he provided when they tried to trap him was really a glorious manifestation of his wisdom. And so it was a doubly bad thing for them. They look bad and he looks good, the exact opposite of what they wanted. And so finally, they're just like, we're not even, we don't even dare to ask him another question. We're so sick of the way it's been going. Now, I want to conclude by getting you to notice something interesting in verse 35, if you look back there with me. Luke 20, 35. What is that? Who's this? That's a unique sound. <laughs> Sounded like an alarm clock. Doesn't bother me. It happened. <laughs> Just a little different sound that I'm used to hearing on Sunday mornings. But anyway, look at Luke 20, 35 with me. It didn't mean that it's time for me to stop the sermon, did it? I mean, I wasn't set for that time. Those who are, notice this, considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. This is super fascinating to me. Jesus talked about those who are, notice this, worthy to attain the resurrection from the dead. Those two words, worthy and attain, make me think of earning or achieving. I mean, those are synonyms. A synonym for worthy is, or worthiness, is earning, earning something, attaining is achieving. And it sounds strange because we know that we do not earn or achieve eternal life. Instead, it is something that is freely given to us. Salvation is a free gift. And then you say, well, Pastor Scott, maybe you're making a big deal out of this. You're just taking this one verse. No, this is not the only place that talks about being worthy or unworthy. I'll give you two more examples so you can see it's somewhat of a theme. When Jesus preached the parable of the wedding feast, And the invitation went out, and some refused to come. Listen to how Jesus described them. Matthew 22, 8. The king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, because you remember, those who were invited refused to come. And he says, but those invited were not worthy. That's interesting. I would expect Jesus to say, but those who were invited refused. Instead, he emphasized their worthiness. And you're kind of like, why would he do that? Because everyone's unworthy. Listen to the way Paul and Barnabas condemned the Jews who rejected the gospel. Acts 13, 46. They said it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. It was to go to the Jews. Then the Jews were the mouthpiece of the gospel to the Gentiles. Since you thrust it aside, listen to this, Paul said, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. So the Jews judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. So how do we understand people being unworthy of eternal life when eternal life is not something we can earn or deserve? We are saved by grace through faith. But people who trust in themselves, people who believe in their own righteousness, 
People who deny their sinfulness and need for a savior or deny their need to be saved are showing what? Their unworthiness. To be worthy of eternal life, you must repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ and his sacrifice. It is completely counterintuitive. To be worthy is not about human effort or achievement. To be worthy is to acknowledge that our effort could never be enough and there never could be an achievement that would make us worthy. Instead, worthiness is defined by humility or acknowledgement of sin. Now, if you have never done this, confessed your sinfulness, recognized your need for a savior, you've trusted perhaps in your own righteousness, trusted in yourself versus trusting in Christ, let today be the day of salvation for you. If you have any questions or I can pray for you in any way, I'll be up front after service and I'd consider it a privilege to speak with you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the institution of marriage, the great gift that it is to us. I thank you for children and family. Thank you for the wonderful relationships that we're able to have on this side of heaven. But I pray that we would never exalt them over our relationships with Christ. Help us always to recognize that no matter how important our relationship with our husband or wife or children are, they pale in comparison to our relationships with our Lord and Savior. And that when we get to heaven, we will not be celebrating our relationships with anyone, humanly speaking, whether father, mother, brother, sister, spouse, parent, child. Instead, it will be all about worshiping our Lord and the Savior who died for us and took the punishment for our sins. And we pray all this in his name. Amen.